welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Well, welcome, Kari. It's a delight to have you on the Conversations on Healing podcast. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Good to be here. I'm so fascinated to get into our conversation today because I know that you're an expert in caregiving and that this is a topic that you've professionally dedicated yourself to for so many years. And I feel that you know, just about everyone listening to this podcast at some point in their life is a caregiver of some sort to someone, right? To a child, to a parent, to a sibling, to a loved one somewhere, somehow. And so it's really a universally relevant topic. I can't believe we don't teach it more in schools, that it's not more foundational because it's such a core component of being a human being. Um, So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you and help, you know, our listeners to learn more about some of the fundamentals. So again, thanks for joining me for this important topic. My pleasure. (laughs) So I wanted to start out, you have kind of a a fun acronym that you use called SANE, S-A-N-E. And it's, you know, a method which really um, gives caregivers a roadmap to navigate their emotions and help them to feel supported, appreciated, not guilty, and energized while caregiving for others. So I thought maybe you wanted to explain a little bit to our listeners about the SANE method. Mm -hmm. I remember when my editor and I came up with this acronym because I kept talking about the concepts of it. And then he came up with the word SANE because so many of us feel insane or not grounded. Uh, Sane is sometimes a a difficult word for some people. The opposite actually is difficult. Insane. To feel insane is so uncomfortable. So I wanted to come up with something that helped people on a regular basis sort of check in with themselves, if that makes sense. And so I can use a recent example of how I use the same method. Great. I was home for a family reunion and I live in Norway, uh, two hours north of Oslo, Norway. And I lost my mother who suffered with Huntington's disease in 2002, she died. And my father and I are really, really close. And I used to live with him in Minnesota and then I moved here when I got remarried. So we planned a family reunion, got my brothers from the East Coast and my sister, we took her out of the nursing home because she has Huntington's disease. And if you know anything about Huntington's disease, it's like Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's all mixed. So she was tough and I said, I really don't think we should be taking her out of the nursing home and bringing her to a, an Airbnb that we've rented and trying to take care of her. So there was a lot of emotions going on. We siblings hadn't been together. Um, Dad's wife is failing. There was just a lot going on. So I sat myself down at one point and said, all right, Kari, here's, here's time for you to use your own method. Are you feeling supported? Yes, I've got my husband there. Supported is someone that I can talk to and just kind of let everything that I'm feeling come out and I know he's not going to judge me. I'm feeling supported. All right. Am I feeling appreciated? This one's key and it's tough for people because when I write about it and talk about it, it's giving up the idea of being thanked by others for what you're doing. And I can tell when I'm not feeling appreciated, when I'm in a way making announcements of all the work I've done to get this family to come together because I'm verbally looking for that thank you, for that gratitude from other people. And what I try to help people do is 
go inside ourselves and say, wow, I've pulled this together. I've, I've helped organize the tickets. Um, and I, I, yep, I've done a good job. Good job, Kari. You know, to, to give it to ourselves. So same, so supported, appreciated, not guilty for doing, for not doing enough. That's the piece that people struggle with. I don't know if I'm doing enough. I haven't been, I haven't seen my sister enough. I don't go home to see my dad enough. Um, we get into these places of not enough. And that really is about guilt. Um, so again, I have people actually, and I did this in the family reunion, I wrote down, okay, here's what I've done. Here's the positive energy I've sent out to people. <laughs> and I have done enough. And again, going back to the supportive person, uh-huh, I've done enough. I can let go of the guilt. So when I do that, supported, appreciated, not guilty, then I can feel energized. And when I feel energized, when I have those positive vibes going through, I'm a better person and I'm a better caregiver. Yeah. And, you know, it's that point right there that I think we so often miss. It's that we're not able to be a good caregiver for someone else if we are not energized ourselves. Like if we're completely burnt out at wits, at wits end, frustrated, upset, angry, emotional, crazy, you know, like all of it, right? When we're just totally lost in our own messy mess, it's exactly. just not a good time to try to be, you know, taking care of someone else. And so that attention to self and where we might, you know, really need help is just so critical. So, you know, I wanted to ask you, Kari, because you've been doing this for 30 years and, you know, have both personal and tremendous professional experience. When you think about what you've learned about caregiving, you know, over all of these years, if you were to condense, you know, some of the most important lessons learned for our mm -hmm. listeners, what would you want them to hear? That this is not something you're naturally trained to do. So when it comes time, like when we picked up my sister from the nursing home and the nurse handed us a bag of 14 different medications in bottles, then we're not trained to do that kind of thing. And so don't beat yourself up. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm scared. That's probably my biggest message. The second message that I talk to people, because my background has been in helping aging parents, is that we don't talk about aging in this. We, we, we talk about aging, age avoidance. We talk plenty about what creams can get rid of wrinkles, but we don't talk about how, what happens when we age. What are some of the natural changes that come? Uh, what's normal aging, if, there, can you, if you can make that, normal aging versus aging with disease? Not everybody gets a little dementia as they get older. Um, forgetting is normal, but Cognitive decline isn't necessarily normal. And when we don't talk about these things and we start to see things happen, that's when I get a lot of phone calls saying, okay, Kari, I was home with mom and I'm seeing this, 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 and this, and this. Does she have Alzheimer's? And because we don't talk about aging, we jump from, I haven't seen mom for five years. Does she have Alzheimer's now? So the whole notion of, um, asking, what is normal aging? How can I help my parents as they age and help myself as I age? Because we, we will change. We are changing. We're not going to be as nimble and mobile as we are now. It goes back to what you were saying about being kind to ourselves. That we don't know what we're doing necessarily in this new role of giving care to someone else. So 
take a moment, take a breath. And that's when I return to the saying, are you feeling supported? Are you feeling appreciated? Are you not feeling guilty? So then you can have energy to check out what you need to check out in order to do this new role called caregiving. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, that's okay too. <laughs> if you need to, like my father-in-law, he said, help, I, I'm at my limit. And that's when we moved mom-in-law into um, an assisted living. He knew his limit. He went a little bit past it. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Till death to do us part doesn't necessarily mean I have to take on the full role and all the heavy lifting of caregiving. Mm -hmm. You know, and what you just described there, Kari, I feel like I see that so much where someone goes generally a bit past their limit, you know, like that is so common in caregiving. And then like once you've done that and then sort of a flag goes up, <laughs> it's like, I can't do it anymore. Help, <laughs> help, help. Um, and, you know, so there's a good piece there also of self-awareness that it's really easy to go beyond your threshold. And I feel yeah. like to ask sooner rather than later, because there does seem to be that human tendency when we love someone so much to go too far because, you know, we do love them so much. And so there's so much emotionally invested in the relationship. And it's that boiling frog thing, you know, you put a frog into cool, tepid water and turn up the heat, the frog doesn't notice it. That's what I see so many times. Um, my Both my dad and his second wife were caregivers and they met in grief group. And I remember them saying, we're not going to be caregivers again. <clears throat> well, hello, now my dad's a caregiver again. And um, in fact, I used my same method, method on my dad when I had a phone call with him recently. And I said, okay, dad, how can I support you? And he said, this, this conversation, I, ju I just need to talk it through. I good, great. Are you feeling appreciated? And we just walked through it because he just needed that check-in, so to speak. Um, because he doesn't realize how much he is adding every day to the tasks he's doing for his wife. And it's not out of meanness on her part. It's, it's just all of a sudden um, I can ask Dwight to help me do X, Y, Z instead of getting up and doing it myself because I don't feel good. I get that. Um, but now Dwight, my dad, has things way too many things on his plate and he's got his own issues. Yeah. And you know, what you said there, that, that statement of like, oh, we'll never be caregivers again, best laid plans, right? <laughs> For all of us, you know, it's so funny. We have these ideas that we can control these things in life and then life tells us what's actually going to happen. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so that's why, again, that whole notion of wouldn't it be great if we, like you said in the beginning, if we, if there were classes on, well, I always want classes on aging right away mm -hmm. in, in grade school and, and, and on up. Let's talk about how we're going to change, even though maybe that's a little difficult, but still we can get the conversation going so that we don't keep avoiding this thing called aging and growing older. But to talk about giving care to someone and, and what does that mean? Um, how can you take care of yourself while you're giving care to someone else? Because it's so very important. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get to that? And I remember having these conversations when I first started out in this field some 30 years ago. <laughs> and first of all, they told me no one wants to talk about aging. Okay, except for the conferences that I went to that where we loved all talking about aging. But then the same thing about caregiving. And I, it's, it's, it's hard to swallow that we still aren't really identifying the stress that is taken on, especially family caregivers not to diminish what's taken the stress that happens on professional caregivers because they've got their own set of stress but family caregivers who are absolutely did not go into this uh training and did not did not choose this as a job 
and it's being thrust upon them. And I'm seeing that over here in um, the country of Norway too. They're not, they're used to the system really taking care of their parents and that system is being taxed. And so the kids are like, what? What do you mean I have to help out? So it's, it's with the population changing so drastically around the globe and more and more older people demanding more from fewer younger people, um, we really need to figure out how we can do this thing called caregiving differently, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think we should talk about aging because, you know, as you've mentioned here already in our conversation, it's not talked about. And I think it's actually something worse than that, which you indicated when you said about, you know, our focus is on anti-aging, right? Like mm -hmm. it's on be youthful, everything's young, 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 young. And <clears throat> so not only are we not talking about what really is happening as you age, but we're also sort of trying to defy it as if it's something you could possibly defy. <laughs> we're gonna beat it. Yeah, we're, 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 she, we're gonna beat it. That's what I get. You're defeated. If you give in to aging, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, it's a natural process. Now, and I get, I think people, we get confused because I think anyone can give up on life at any point in their, on their lifespan. They can give up and just kind of check out. And I think we equate that checking out with aging. And what I see is when people get older, and I'm 58, and what I'm seeing is that I'm okay with taking a slower pace, not being in the competitive rat race. Um, and that's okay, but it's not failing. It's, it's a realization that at this point in my life, I want to do things a little differently. Um, I'm a spinning instructor. That's one of the things that I do. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be a spinning instructor. I thought that was the dumbest thing ever. But I did it during COVID because I was trying to find a way to exercise and I taught myself and then two guys joined me and anyway, it's been a hoot. I love it, love it, love it, love it. And now I bike to uh, school because I've become a school teacher at a small little grades one through 10 school. So I bike to the ferry, take the ferry, and then bike to school. It's been phenomenal. It's a real big change. That whole notion of doing our life differently and not keeping up and not choosing to be in the rat race, um, to me, that's part of wisdom that comes with aging. But some people see that as a, oh, she's not as, um, she's not as, uh, she's not as successful as she used to be. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, and, and what I see in older adults, and I'm hearing and catching myself do this, when I talk to my dad, when I talk to other older adults, they reminisce, right? It's like we want to validate our lives. And part of that is, I have been important. I have made my mark in life. Let me tell you a story about when I did dum -ba dum -ba dum And I think that comes, that whole notion of the importance of reminiscing, it's a good thing, but it can also get us into um, a kind of a negative hole because we're only, we're not seeing what we're doing right now, which is maybe more, to use that kind of cool term, being, <laughs> we're, taking life differently. We have a different definition around our life. And it's not the maybe go, go, be on stage all the time, um, make a lot of money, be in the Wall Street rat race, but it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's part of changing with aging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think sometimes we're 
losing sight of that value that comes with aging. Like you said, being able to slow down, being able to say no, being able to make new choices, try different things. And then there's that whole other element that you're pointing to of kind of an externalized um, seeking for value, right? That my value has come from the things I've done. But what if that's not the location of our value? What if our value is within, not based on what we're doing <laughs> or our achievements or our success in the material world? Or <laughs> but what right. if it's something so much deeper than that? Our presence, you know, our inner compass, the people we've loved, the way we've loved, how we love, how we, you know, connect with others, how we engage with others. And even just more essentially than that, the kindness that's in our own heart, you know, there's like a whole different way of uh, understanding our value as beings that doesn't have to have external accomplishment at the fore. <laughs> so and, lots of different ways to look at it. And I don't know if you would agree with me, but I think COVID has taught us a little bit about how to find or rediscover that, either find it or rediscover that inner compass. Because we've all been forced to spend some time alone. And I remember going on Facebook when COVID first, you know, was two weeks, three weeks, and the people that were real true extroverts and, and craved that meeting after work and, and meeting up with friends and the camaraderie that happened in the work, physical workplace, were sort of going nuts. <laughs> I have been that person, but what I discovered was I really like spending time on my own and I live in the country, in nature, and I find so much value there and so much appreciate um, picking up a good book or sitting outside looking at the fjord or, <laughs> yeah, hanging out. Yeah, and, and so this idea that you have shared about, you know, what are some of the natural processes that happen when we age, right? One of them is maybe we want to spend more time in nature. Maybe we want to slow down. Maybe, you know, we can respect that there are changes that happen in the body and those aren't all bad. Like, because sometimes those give you a chance to to move more slowly through life, to maybe be a little more present with what's happening. Um, so, you know, things that sometimes culturally have been interpreted negatively may actually have a lot of positives. You know, I think back like my grandmother, how she could sit so patiently with me for hours, but younger people couldn't do that. <laughs> I had an interesting um, thing happen at our family reunion because I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised at how lovely it was to have my sister there. She and I have not always had the best relationship. I unfortunately, when she got Huntington's, promised her I would be with her the whole way. I'm gonna be by your side. Where did that come from? That came from guilt that I don't have it. And her, she, what she heard was that I'm gonna be with her, you know, practically move in with her. What I heard was, or what I meant was, well, I'll try to make it to as many appointments as I can and support you and while still maintaining a balance in my own life. So we clashed a lot and we, we really never got along growing up. So it's been a hard relationship. I was so surprised at how delightful it was to have her there. And what I noticed is that we all, when we sat around, we had this fire pit outside at this Airbnb and we sat around and we all engaged with her. She has a very, very difficult time talking. That's part of the disease. She just can't get the words out. But we engaged with her, right, Anne? Um, isn't that true, Anne? Or, um, oh, I love that, don't you, Anne? You know, bringing her in. When we the family gathered for a larger reunion where more family members came, one of her daughter-in-laws daughter approached me and said, how is it having Anne there? Because when she's at our house, she doesn't say anything. She just sits. She hardly goes to the bathroom. I mean, we, and I thought to myself, you know what? They move in a much faster way. Um, it's very difficult sometimes 
in caregiving to be with someone who moves slower, who doesn't answer your questions right away, who says something off the wall that doesn't match what you asked about or uh, what you're talking about. And again, if you're not trained to go with that, to jump in that play and be with that person where they're at, it's really difficult and we tend to have seen people then just dismiss them. Um, I also, and I do not want to overgeneralize, but I also think that young people, younger people move, not only move more quickly, but they're on technology more, that can happen. So if they're talking to mom and they're also looking at their phone and they're talking to mom, for someone who has got a disease like Huntington's or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's, the key is to really focus in with them and to be present with them and to make eye contact with them and to maybe even physically put your hand on their arm to connect with them. If you're not doing that, you you have to work harder to make that connection. So I was, I, it was an eye opener for me and a reminder how important it is all the times that I've talked to families that we really need to slow down. But to, uh, boy, I'm just jumping right back to what we're saying. If we, if we can talk about aging and caregiving along the lifespan, then maybe this concept of slowing down and being with our loved ones with diminished capacity wouldn't be so foreign. Yeah, exactly. Because we could also recognize, again, the value in it, right? That there's value in being able to slow down and take life in differently at a very different pace, that the quality of that can be experienced quite radically differently. You know, it's, it can feel entirely different um, yeah. to meet life in that way. So yeah. I want to ask you, Kari, because you've mentioned Huntington's because that, you know, you have, it sounds like two family members um, who are, have our living have been living with that. Um, and so I know also, you know, so many of our listeners will at some point have a loved one with dementia or Alzheimer's. And so, you know, these are not simple caregiving experiences, right? These are very, very, very difficult. And so I want you to share, you know, just some of the core principles of what you think helps people to get through caring for a loved one with something like dementia or Alzheimer's or Huntington's. So share some of what you think are really important things to, to help get you through it. Okay. I'll just list them and then we can talk about what comes to mind. What I talk about, learn everything you can about the disease. Um, dementia is describes symptoms so you have to have a disease in order to have dementia so what disease is causing the dementia learn everything about that and get your loved one to a neurologist family docs are great but these diseases that cause dementia really need the hand of a neurologist and getting a diagnosis, especially for when it's younger onset, is so difficult because we as a society just can't believe that someone so young can have this. So it's easier to get when someone's older a diagnosis, but then it can also be misdiagnosed. So be learn as much as you can. Write down what you're noticing. Try to set your emotions aside when you see a loved one and say, this is what I'm noticing, all these things. Um, and it's different from how they used to act. So instead of jumping right away and assuming that this person has dementia because everybody gets a little dementia as we get older, which is not true, <laughs> write down what you're noticing. And then for you to going back to being gentle with yourself and know that you're going to have to ask for help. 
and that's okay. The other thing is, because I deal a lot with families taking care of mom and dad, right? Your brothers are not going to step up to the plate like you want them to. I'm picking on my brothers. I love my brothers dearly. But we, get, we don't live all in the same town with our family anymore. That's very, very common, right? And generally, there's one sibling that is home or the lead caregiver. And depending on how that person takes on this role, they can get really upset with the other family members who aren't stepping up to the plate like that person thinks they should. Family does not all of a sudden get along when someone needs help. That There is nothing. In fact, we all return to being 12 years old. I tell people to remember how you sat at the dining room table and who talked, who is obnoxious, who checked out. That's kind of how the family caregiving circus is going to be. So family does not change all of a sudden when mom or dad or a loved one needs care. They will maintain who they've been. Um, and then the other piece is distance caregivers. Because we all live so spread apart from each other. Distance caregivers uh, feel guilty, really guilty that they're not there. So when they come, they really like to upset the apple cart. And the person that is there or the primary caregiver um, they all of a sudden, the distance caregivers no more, have all the answers and want to change the furniture in the house. So <laughs> there are these common threads of caregiving with family that happen. So it's okay to know that it's going to be messy. It's going to be messy. And then add in that mom is not just aging generally, aging and has some cognitive impairment, but she's got Alzheimer's disease. So in many cases that changes the person, right? Um, they're still in there. That person is still in there, absolutely. But they show themselves in a little bit different way and they try to communicate with you, but it comes out all mumble jumble. Just roll with it. Doesn't have to be a perfect conversation. Best conversations I've had with people with dementia, with whatever disease they have, is they talk to me and I say, you know, that's right. I get it. I hear you. I agree. Doesn't matter what they're saying. They're trying to say something. So be present with them and don't argue with them and agree. And then if they're that type of person that you can hold their hand or sit close to them or listen to music, it's okay to just be with that person and hang out with them. Don't have to solve it. It's not something that's going to be solved. You know, it's interesting in improvisational theater, there's a rule that kind of whatever crazy idea your partner comes up with in a scene, you, you go along with it. There's an inherent yes. You say yes. And you do that because it is what creates the fun in the improv. It's what allows it to kind of keep going. Otherwise, you sort of kill it. You sort of stop it. And I've often thought with people who are experiencing, you know, especially things like Alzheimer's, that if we carry an inherent Yes, just like you would in improvisational theater. If they want to go there, then you just go there. You just sort of say yes, then that's where we're going. We're going on that ride. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that somehow that like it actually does wonders because does. It, it's a going with. I think it's the accompaniment piece that's just yeah. so, so critically important there. Yeah. And it's it's not easy. I I'm it's not. I used to run a um Dementia care community, it's not easy. Um, so that's why you have to step out. <laughs> that's why you, you have to step out and find that support, find that appreciation within yourself, let go of the guilt and rediscover your own energy. You have to do that same method in order to 
thrive more than survive, but thrive in your caregiving. Um, it can be a whole lot of fun, just like you were saying with improv. If you if you say yes, it can be sort of delightful. Oh, I I my best friend died. She had um, early onset, young onset Alzheimer's, and we would drive in the car together and listen to eighties music. <laughs> And she put on her sunglasses, but she put them on upside down. And she was looking at me, looking at me, just laughing. And I just said, Catherine, <laughs> this is the best ride I've ever had. I, I, it was so great. And there was another time I remember being with her at a friend's house who had this be has this beautiful house overlooking Red Wing downtown beautiful Red Wing Minnesota and she was sitting in a in a one of those hug round bubble chair type things and she had a glass of wine and she was holding it and she just spun her chair around and looked at me and went like this you know she just nodded her head like this is life isn't it Kari and I just said yep so yeah, I love that. I like your I like your idea of saying yes. Yeah. So I said yes to having my sister there and it turned out to be really cool. The only time she got upset was when my aunt came with peach dumplings, a tip traditional Czech meal. And everybody was chatting and no one was fixing the peach dumplings and she just stomped her foot and said, "Peach dumplings now." <laughs> okay. And All right, then. <laughs> we're gonna make those. <laughs> yes, that's so, gonna happen. <laughs> that's gonna happen. So that's that's the saying yes. Instead right. of getting frustrated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, another piece of this that I really want to touch on with you, Kari, is mm -hmm. you know, I work a lot with parents who are caregiving for children who are seriously ill. And sometimes what I see those parents do to me is like, it's an impossible ask of a human being. I don't, I honestly, I don't even understand how some of the parents are able to do what they do. Like, I think I, I'm just like, I don't know how, how you actually do this in real life. You know, they're waking up every two hours to do breathing teeth treatments and medication and change. I mean, it's like an insane level of caregiving that is just seems like truly inconceivable. And my personal wish is we design a world with way more support in those extreme situations so that nobody has to do that. That is absolutely the world that I would like to see because I think it's just like entirely unjust. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to talk about in your book, The Unexpected Caregiver, which is both for professionals, but also for lay people who are the unexpected caregiver. Um, you talk about setting limits and ways, you know, not to build resentment and how do you actually take care of yourself in the face of these huge obstacles? And why is that even important to be able to set limits and boundaries? And I know that piece can be really confusing and hard for people, but yeah. it's essential. And so I want to give you a chance to speak to that, like why setting healthy boundaries and limits for yourself matters so much. How I usually turn it around to people who are the caregivers that are, are caring to the nth degree, like you described, in a, in a way that they actually can hear it better, is that if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be cranky, you're going to be short, um, you're going to be um, a mean caregiver. And I don't think you want to be a mean caregiver. I think you want to be a loving, kind caregiver. And in order for you to be that loving, kind caregiver, you have to take a nap. You have to go out for coffee with your gal pals. Uh, you have to let other people step in, even though they're not going to do it like you think they should do it. Give care like you think they should give care. Because, yeah, you, you, 
you need to do that in order to be a kind caregiver. And I know that's what you want to be, is a kind caregiver and give lots of love. So it, it, it gets old, you know, saying put on your own oxygen mask. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> but it's so true. It's almost gotten overused, but it's so true. And they're still saying it on airplanes. So we have to do that in order to do the job that we want to do. Um, when we go to jobs outside of our house, outside of our caregiving, we do that, we get enough sleep. And if we don't get enough sleep, we don't do as well of a, a good of a job. And we could get fired. <laughs> So you need to look at that caregiving role in a similar way, that you need to do a good job. So taking care of yourself allows you to be do a good job and be kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, it's interesting. I feel very clear in my own life that there's a very strong relationship between being able to be kind and compassionate and knowing when to say no, because oh, yeah. if I don't respect my own limits and say no and push way past what I'm able to do, then I stop being as kind and compassionate because I'm irritated and stressed and past the point of no return. And that's yeah. not a good place for any of us to hang out in. And so as you know, especially as I've gotten older, fortunately, you learn some things as you go along this trail of life. I've learned just say no. Like if if that's my limit and I genuinely know that is the the place I need to say no, then I simply say no. I don't waste the energy anymore that I used to waste on, you know, <laughs> saying yes, 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 in unnecessarily, where you know, then then we're not like you said, then we're the mean caregiver. So who wants to be the mean caregiver? <laughs> that's not very useful. <laughs> no. And, and you're, you're, you're right on. I mean, I too have learned to say no in my lifetime and it has caused some pain. Um, I've said no. And um, some people haven't liked that I've said no. But that's where again, I return to my same method and I check out with my some of my best friends. This is what I'm doing. Okay. I appreciate the time that I've gotten back so that I can get rest or or feel rejuvenated, um, I can let go of the guilt because I'm a better person all around in the long run. Um, and then because I've done those three steps, I have more energy and I can approach the caregiving situation in a creative way because caregiving also takes a lot of creativity. And so I can come back and be creative. Yeah. And I think the other side of this coin, too, that it took me time to come to understand is also to respect other people's no's. So now when someone says to me a no, I, I just don't get upset by that at all. I just respect it. I'm just like, yeah, that's their no. And if I still need whatever the thing it is that I need, I look for someone else. I like I look for another resource. I just simply move on and respect and look, seek, you know, whatever is needed elsewhere. And that works perfectly fine. Like there are other solutions, you know, in typical life situations, there are other solutions. If you just stay open and creative, like you were saying, which is also what, really important. Yeah. And what you and I are talking about, some people may hear it and say, well, that's easy for you. But I'm at this point now because it wasn't easy for me to get it, it. I was someone that overextended myself. I was someone that promised, overpromised, and did not say no. Now I've gotten to that point, and and I'm not saying that in a blink you can all of a sudden change. And I don't think you're saying that either. We've gotten to this place, and realize how much of a more relaxed and healthier place it is to be in. But there's some, it, 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 you get bruised along the way getting here. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's a practice. Like so many things it in is. life, it's an ongoing yeah. practice. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 
we all get to continue that practice. It's not like it ends, you know, at one point. I want to ask you, Kari, because I know we have a lot of listeners who may suddenly be in the position of becoming that unexpected caregiver. And so I'd like for you to, to share someone who's newly in that role. What are some of like the initial resources or things that you would want to point them towards that you think are particularly valuable? So whatever is going on with the person they're giving care to, to find out about that the illness or the disease or whatever, do that. Find a support group. Find people who are going through the same thing. Um, and again, depending on what it is, that's where I would direct you. So in my field, when it's um, aging parents and it's dementia, I know exactly where I'm going to point that person to find those resources. Um, and start, you know, just kind of take that moment and find, get your team assembled. Get your team assembled. Get that person that you can call and just um, let go of your frustration with, and you know that that person's not gonna judge you or shame you. That person's just gonna listen and love you. They're also not gonna try to fix you. Um, so line up your team, the people that are gonna support you through this. And um, maybe write yourself some notes too about what, like in the initial stages, I've, I've worked with people where we've done this. All right, you're entering into this caregiving situation. What, it's just like when I would say to people who uh, were moving mom into assisted living, the question you want to ask any assisted living, when are you going to call me, the daughter, and tell me that I have to move mom? So I want you to write that down for yourself. When am I going to, what is my breaking point? When am I going to just really know that I'm in this too deep? Um, what's the last thing that I, like my, my father-in-law, he said, I asked him this question, what's, what, what's your limit when you know that you're going to have to get professional help in? And he was able to say, I, I don't think I can bathe my wife. Okay. Write that down. Because as we talked about it earlier, we tend to, oh, I guess I can just help wash up a little bit. And, you know, well, I guess if I got a shower chair, I could do, yeah. So those things is where I would start to begin. And gentle, gentleness with yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned um, early in your response to this question, support groups. And I, I know that you have developed support groups for unexpected mm -hmm. caregivers. And so you obviously feel there's tremendous value in that kind of camaraderie and accompaniment and sharing stories with one another and listening to one another. Um, and, and is it the essential just capacity to go together through a shared life experience? Like, what do you think is so important about the support groups? They get you. So in my field, for example, um, when I would sit in support groups and someone would say, a son would say, well, my dad was really stubborn today and he's driving me crazy and I, uh, I, I just wanted to tell him to uh, jump off a cliff and blah, 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 blah. And another person will say, oh, yep, I've been there. This happened with me, blah, blah. You know, it's like you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to explain. Um, one of the most beautiful moments I had in the support group, really, was when this son said, um, I have an embarrassing question. I don't know how to put on adult depends, and my dad needs them. And the guy next to him said, oh, here, I'll teach you. And he got on a napkin. <laughs> he lays it down. He says, listen, <laughs> this is what you do. And I just watched it unfold, and I said, bingo. It's not a big deal. Um, it, 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 there was a solution. It was real. No embarrassment. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Great camaraderie. Um, Kari, I want to ask you, if there's someone listening to the podcast right now who's feeling very desperate as a caregiver, mm -hmm. they're in that place of 
total kind of feeling lost and, and desperate. What do you think is the first point of light out of that desperation? What would you, what would you share to that person listening? It's always my trusted friend. It's, it's calling that person that I know can talk me off the cliff that I know has been there for me before. And I can say, um, I've got a lot, I, I, this is what I'm feeling and, and that person can help talk me down. That's what I would say, you've got to find that person because a lot of this is your animal brain, that amygdala piece, that emotional piece just responding. And when that gets triggered, it, it it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop on its own because it just feeds, the emotions feed on each other. So you need someone outside to say, whoa, <laughs> you know, let's, let's maybe look at this more rationally. I'm hearing you and now let's back up. Yeah. I would imagine after 30 years of being involved in caregiving that you're able to see some of the benefits of caregiving. And so I would love to hear what you see are some of the benefits. Hmm. When you talked about um, saying yes, and um, I've called that getting into their reality, um, getting into their play, that when you are able to do that, you let go of all the self-talk that's in your head and you get this real sense of um, just being with this other person and, and the self-talk goes away if you're able to really connect and say yes to that person and be with them. That's a huge benefit. The other benefit that I see from caregiving is you, if you're able and patient, you get to hear stories um, from a person that maybe you've heard before, but you get to ask different questions and hear different parts of that story. The other real benefit is there's a physical connection that can happen, an energetic connection, whether you're sitting beside that person or not. I think I've talked about this and just um, holding their hand or holding them in your arm and we don't spend a lot of time doing that. We don't spend enough time, in my opinion. So there's that physical connection that can happen. Um, I think overall what I'm saying is it's a lot of expressions of love that can happen if we're open to it, that we get from caregiving. Um, we're doing a loving thing. And when we're in that present mode, there's a lot of love energy that you get. Yeah. And I want to also ask you about healing in the context of caregiving. You mentioned with your sister how you guys had, you know, kind of never had the easiest of relationships. And now, you know, <clears throat> I, I would imagine it's increasingly difficult. But where do you see that there is room for healing in the context of caregiving? How do you understand the relationship between those two? Well, if, if you look at my sister and me, part of it is me letting go of the issues that we've struggled with over the years and accepting that that was, that, that was our relationship and it wasn't always easy. And so what? So what? Um, there are intense things can, that can happen in, in my line of work between um, adult children taking care of parents where maybe there's been abuse or other scars that are much harder to heal. Uh, and so healing can also be walking away. Healing can be walking away and letting that go. Um, I also had have had many experiences with people where healing was coming to a place of purposely forgiving that person 
But I'm not saying that that has to be in all situations. But I have seen that happen. And there's a peace that can come with that. Just as there's a peace that can come with um, mother-daughter situations where they don't get along and I just need to walk away. So that healing, I, I think, is real individual. Um, because I, I right, healing is what how we're taking care of ourselves, um, and we we can't. I can't know the healing that like went on when I cared for my grandpa. I don't. I think there was some forgiveness and healing in our relationship that uh, went on. There was a gentleness that that was a part of when I was giving care to him, and I've seen that in other people's relationships too. The other healing piece that is really challenging that I've seen is when someone with Alzheimer's disease, for example, um, lives in a community and gets a new husband and the actual husband comes in and there's a real sense of surrendering to that process with the, um, the actual husband and just saying, okay, that's where that person is. Um, so yeah, I think I think that gentleness and that surrendering, if we're able to do that, that's that goes back to your saying. It's still about saying yes, right? Right. And a lot in what you just described too is around letting go, right? Yeah. Like letting go of what was, like that was then, but this is now, and in this. Now it's not what was then. It's it's a whole new now. It's it's what's happening right here that's fresh in this alive and awake moment. And that's not the thing that happened 30 years ago. <laughs> so but right. it's as humans, we you know don't always have the easiest time with that. And it's actually to me, there's another beauty here of like how remarkable if you could actually do that. You know, let's say you are that husband who goes and now his wife is now has a new husband in this new life with Alzheimer's. And my God, if you can love someone enough to be okay with that and to find yeah. a sort of capacity for peace and yeah. understanding, wow, yeah. that's yeah. big love. <laughs> that's big and love. It is big love, and, but, but it, it, it goes back to what I said when you, you know, said, what, what do caregivers need to do? If you know about the disease, like in this case, it was Alzheimer's disease, if you learn about it, and you, you know that this is a brain disease, so this, this wife wasn't doing this on purpose or out of maliciousness, right? This was, she looked at this other person and thought it was her boyfriend from high school, her love of her life. It's the it's 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 the the dysfunction and the disease that is causing her to respond like this. So if the this husband that I worked with was able to see that, and he visited quite often, and um, hung out with everybody in the in the dementia care community that I lived in or worked in. But um, yeah, it's it's not always easy for people. But again, if you understand and get education about what's happening with this disease, and if you are with a support group and they say, oh yeah, my mom did that too, or yeah, mm -hmm, it's really hard. But um, sometimes I, I would I remember when um, adult children would come in and if mom didn't have her glasses on, because mom wore glasses, they would get upset, wear our mom's glasses. And I would say, your mom doesn't wear glasses anymore, in her mind. Right. Besides her neighbor has them and she really likes them. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's working out, working out, <laughs> but it's really difficult to, to uh, let go. Let go is a good one. And that's, that happened. That comes in my sane, you know, method too, is that whole notion. We've got to let go, let go of being thanked, let go of the guilt, let it go. Well, Kari, before we, wrap up today, is there anything else that feels really important for you to share with our listeners about caregiving or what you've learned, you know, over these many years of being in this field? Just to remind you that it's okay to reach out and ask for help. Absolutely. Do it. It's okay. It's not an embarrassing thing. 
so many people are going through this. So many people are struggling in silence because they feel they should be able to care for their spouse or they should be able to care for their child. My goodness, what's wrong with me that I don't know how to care for them? No, this is beyond. This is beyond normal caring for someone. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. And that our listeners can hang on to that sane method, yes. you know, to ask for support, to check in on appreciation, to not feel guilty so that you can feel energized. Yes. Like that's so <laughs> beneficial. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and time with us today. I really appreciate having the conversation with you and I've learned a great deal. Likewise. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.